If you'd like to stand with us this morning, we're going to do another new song. I know the 
Baptist family here in, at the, in the balcony, we uh, like to open in a word of prayer, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, your, your faithfulness still stands as much today as it did in the beginning, and it will stand forever. We trust in you, and we believe in you, and we thank you for the, the love that you've given to us. We pray that you are with us today as we hear from your word, and we pray that you would let that penetrate into our hearts and into our lives, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you see, we're, we're doing our social distancing best here today. Um, if you want to uh, do our, our greeting this morning, um, we can do some air elbows or whatever you call it there, but uh, try, to, try to limit your contact as much as we can. Um, we'll do that in just a second. Um, Max Churchill has passed away this week, and uh, we would... Uh, do what we can. We'd look to have the opportunity to serve Letta in this time and her family. Um, pray for them and uh, maybe send a word of encouragement. And uh, when we find out any information about the services, we'll pass that along as best we can. So we're sad to hear about that, but we are joyous knowing that Max is now being taken care of by our Lord. And uh, we'll do our best to take care of Lita while she's still here with us. Good morning. While we're finishing up our greeting, I would like to draw your attention to our bulletin that is in your chairs this week. And just to share a couple of announcements in there regarding the ministry teams. Um, our church wants to live in the light of the gospel. And if we are followers of Jesus, we should, number one, want to minister to others, and number two, know that God has equipped us to do that. So I would encourage you to be praying about how God would like to use you. And there are some teams forming in the resource room, which is right behind that wall. There is a bulletin board that has been put up, and some of the teams that are already grouping are on that bulletin board if you would like to join in with one of those teams or if you maybe have another passion that is not shown there, we could add some more groups. So uh, please be praying about that. Um, also, serving one another, we are encouraging those that are worshiping at home in our balcony, good morning. Um, the ones that are seated in the center front are able to turn around and wave and tell them good morning, but the rest of us that are out around are not able to do that. So you will notice there are some posters throughout the congregation. And I would ask at the end of our service today, if you would grab a poster that is near you and have your row of people come forward with the poster and hold it up, and we will share that with our group at home and let them know that we are worshiping with them and that we love and care about them. Um, also, in our bulletin is the Operation Christmas Child collection. You might have noticed the little table out front that has some cute little toys on it, and that is our June collection, is the Summer Fun Toys. So if you would have an opportunity to pick up a few of those items, they will be put in a shoebox that is sent out in November. Um, also, over here in the adult wing is another table and there are some cards that you're able to select some ideas of gifts. Um, if you would be able to help with that, that would be greatly appreciated and we would let those children know that we love them and that God loves them. And one more announcement that is not in the bulletin. We have um, some graduations this week. Ronnie McCoy, is celebrating with a party on Friday. 
from two to five here at church, and they would like to extend an invitation to the entire congregation if they would like to come and celebrate with that family. That would be greatly appreciated. So let's stand and continue to worship our God. Yeah. 
break the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation.
As we prepare to take our communion this morning, um, up on the overhead we have a, a flow chart of how, how we're going to uh, lovingly and, and uh, serve each other with love and serve each other well. Um, we'll uh, there we go. We'll, uh, I'll start over here with Tom and uh, try and get Tom to come down this way and head back up that way to his row and then Mike and we'll just keep going this way and we'll do this section and then this section and uh, Jason's going to do this section here starting with Angela Potter and coming down and then heading back the other side there and then this section. Um, we'll figure it out as we go but uh, we have a plan. Um, before we do that, when I was young in my faith or I guess you could just say when I was young, um, I learned about Jesus dying for me on the cross, and I, I, it just seemed a little odd. It didn't seem very manly. It didn't seem very godly. You know, I'd, I'd a lot of time, I'd heard the, the stories of the, the Old Testament, you know, the fire and the brimstone, and, uh, and that's who I had the vision in my head of who God was. You know, he's, he's tough. He's not going to lose anything. He's not going to, he's not going to bend. He's not going to yield, but, uh, as I grew and, and the Spirit led me more and more, I, I began to understand, and my view of, my view of God was, uh, was still that He was all-powerful, but the Spirit enlightened my mind, and I became more and more aware of the love of God and just how powerful and encompassing that love is. And, uh, and that includes when, when Jesus died on the cross. Um, but in Genesis chapter 2, God told us, God told us that, uh, that when we sin, we're going to bring death into this world. And then quite a ways later, a long ways later, in Genesis chapter 3, God said that uh, he told Satan that he was going to send one that would destroy Satan, and, uh, but first Satan was going to bruise his heel. So we didn't know it at the time, but that was God's own son that was going to be sent. God's salvation plan began, and Jesus' upcoming death was known by God, but now it was told to man and Satan as well. So in, in, uh, in Jesus' life, how many times did he say, I'm here to do the will of him that sent me? Many times, I didn't count, but uh, it was many times. Um, Jesus' birth was heralded by choirs of angels and bright stars in the east, a celebration in the heavens, but... If Jesus was coming to do the will of him that sent him, he was coming to pay the price for our sins, to pay the death that we earned and that we deserved because of our sin. And God knew it. Jesus knew it. But, uh, but God's love, God's unstoppable, ending love, unending love for you and for me is what sent Christ to that cross to pay for mankind so that we wouldn't be lost. And Jesus said he could send more than 12 legions, he could pray and have more than 12 legions of angels sent to, to remove him from where he was. And uh, yet his love drove him on. And Jesus told Pilate that you could have no power over me except that it were given from above. So God showed us his love. He proved to us his love that day. And that while we, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Christ, pro Christ proved to us that day that his love for us is greater than any other power on earth and that he would give his all to save us. And that is, that is the victory that the, the all-powerful God of the Old Testament won that day. So if we would, prepare Tom if you want to come forward. And uh, Jason, if you want to come give me a hand with this side here. We'll start with Angela. And uh, people in the balcony, um, let's not make this a... Uh, this can be a somber event, but let's also make it a celebration of that love that, uh, that won that, that tremendous victory that day. Luke twenty two nineteen, Jesus said he took the bread and he gave thanks and as he broke it, he gave it to the, his disciples saying, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we eat? The best part of this story is that God told us of this great love he has for us and the great love of our Savior. We don't have to live under the burden of sin, the sin that we've committed. We don't have to live under the shadow of death, but we can live, we can live free. We can live our lives. We can live the life that our God has created for us to live, the, God, the life that our Savior died to pay the sins with his own blood. To live a life spent glorifying our great God. In Matthew 26, verse 27 through 29, I'd like to read. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the, my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's house, in my Father's kingdom. So God said, Jesus said that he's not going to drink this, he's not going to drink the vine again until he drinks it with us, his people, in his kingdom again. Let's, let's 
give a prayer of thanks for this before we drink. Our dear Heavenly Father, the, the love that you have for us is, is unending, and the love that you have for us is, has freed us from, from oppression, from, from death, from the, the penalties that we deserve, the penalties that we have earned. We, uh, we thank you that you have loved us enough to pay those penalties for us, and we thank you that you have given us the strength and the, the ability to live, to live free indeed and to live for you, to live a life glorifying your precious and holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a, a spot on the chair in front of you for the, the cups, and we'll pick those up after the service. Um, as I said, I, I, I don't want to be a party time when we take communion, but I think what God intended for us was to remember that love that he has for us that sent him to that cross. And uh, when we take communion, that's what I pray for. I pray for the remembrance of that love and that compassion and that, that sacrifice that he gave to me. At this time, I'd like to welcome Pastor Jason Crosby. He's uh, from Moody Radio. He's been here before, so he's not really a, a guest. He's, uh, he's a regular part of this, this, uh, this church. So good morning, Pastor Jason. I apologize. Let's do the offering next. If our ushers would come forward. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given to us so abundantly, Lord, through, through your gifts. We, we can have life. We can have life more abundantly. We thank you for the opportunity to give back to you a portion, and we pray that you would bless it and continue to bless the giver. We pray that you would use this according to your will, and again, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. back with you this morning. This is my uh, third time preaching here at uh, First Baptist, and so it's always a delight to worship with you. If we have not met, let me introduce you very quickly to uh, my family and tell you a little bit about uh, the ministry. So the top right, that is uh, my wife Susie. We will be married for 13 years in September. To the left is my oldest daughter, Brinley. She is seven. The uh, bottom left is my son, Eli. He is two. And the bottom right is my daughter, Madison. And she is four. Love those guys. And I want to take a moment, too, and thank your children's ministry team. The last time I was here, I brought Madison with me. And she went back into the children's ministry area, and she came back glowing. And so... I love it as a dad when I can take my children to different places and just know that they are being cared for. And, and so thank you so much for those of you who serve on the, the children's ministry team. 
As I uh, mentioned earlier, I am with Moody Radio. I'm the station manager there, Moody Radio. If you're not familiar with us, we are WDLM. We're a primarily Christian talk radio station located at 89.3 FM and online at moodyradio.org slash quadcities and through the Moody Radio app on your smartphone. We just finished up our spring share. Uh, it's a fundraiser for us, and I am pleased to report that we surpassed our $250,000 goal and are now sitting at almost 106%. But the icing on the cake for us was that during an on-air fundraiser, we presented the gospel at a, uh, several different times, and we had two people place their faith in Jesus Christ during a fundraiser, during a fundraiser. So that was so good, yeah. God is good. God is good. So the biggest reason that I am here today is to continue uh, the series through Habakkuk. Last week, Pastor Matthew took us up to Habakkuk 1.11, where we saw Habakkuk's initial lament that God is letting sin go unpunished, and therefore there is no justice. But God then followed up Habakkuk's lament by showing him that he has already begun to answer Habakkuk's complaint and that the Babylonians are coming to punish the Israelites. And so this week we are going to do our best to navigate through the rest of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2. I love it when a plan comes together. So if you've ever watched the A-Team, you know that was one of Hannibal's frequently used lines. So I, too, love it when a plan comes together. God has made me a planner. So it should not surprise you that going into our last day of share, I was up at 4.45 a.m. with an Excel spreadsheet, and I am mapping out how we, uh, uh, what needed to happen in order for us to reach our goal we were going to use what are called dollar-for-dollar dollar matches to get there. So a dollar-for-dollar dollar match is where a donor says, I'm going to give $1,000 to encourage others to give. So then we go on the air and we tell listeners when $1,000 comes in, we'll add another $1,000 to our total. So going into Saturday, we needed $18,000 to reach the goal, and we had $9,000 remaining in match money. So if we hit 9,000 by 9 a.m., 9 a.m. was the crucial mark because that was our last local hour of share, we would then hit our goal. And getting there would mean we would need a $3,000 match every hour from 6 to 9 a.m. So listen, that's a crazy idea. That is a crazy idea. We, well, number one, we have fewer listeners on Saturday mornings. Number two, the Saturday audience is comprised not of the same people who listen weekdays. And then number three, $2,000 tends to be the ceiling for our listeners during a match. Anything higher than that in an hour, and we tend to come up short. So let me just tell you how God utilized my plan A. <laughs> you ready? We needed $3,000 every hour, right? So here's how God utilized my plan. During the 6 a.m. hour, we had one gift of $100. We'll call that a slow start. During the 7 a.m. hour, we had seven gifts and $3,100. So that's better. But we still needed $5,800 in the 8 a.m. hour. And remember, $2,000 is a stretch. And here we are looking for almost three times that amount. So during the 8 a.m. hour when we needed $5,800, we had 24 gifts and $5,894 came in. Since that time, an extra almost $15,000 has come in for Spring Share. So I went into Spring Share with a plan A. Here's how this works. Here's how I God think it should go, and God's answer back to me was no, no. And what unfolded was God's plan, and it led uh, to me holding on 
tighter to him and worshiping him before, during, and after the final moments of spring share. So here's the thing. I know this morning that I am not alone when it comes to having a plan to present before God. I know that I'm not the only one who does that. You have them too. And whether it was a plan that would change the course of a medical diagnosis or the healing of a relationship or a way for funds to come in, you too have had a plan and God's answer was no or silence. And what unfolded instead was God's plan. And this morning, what we're going to see is we're going to see Habakkuk wrestle with God's rejection of the prophet's plan. And what I hope for us to see in particular is that the Lord is a just and holy God who deals righteously with all people. And he is actively present in the flow of earth's history, especially when we think that he is idle. So let's look at Habakkuk chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 12 and we're going to read through chapter 2, verse 20. Here's what it says. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and are silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watchpost and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as shield, like death he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collect, collects all his, as his own all peoples. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise? And those awake who will uh, make you tremble, then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the peoples shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup and the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell on them. 
What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these are your words. They're not mine. And so, Father, we pray that as we talk about them, that, God, that you would be worshipped. Father, that our hearts would be encouraged where they need encouragement. That our hearts would be pierced where they need to be pierced. God, that all of this message would be used to realign us, to redirect us back to you, to correct our thinking where it needs correction, to affirm our thinking where it needs affirmation. Father, we just want you to be worshipped. That's why we're here this morning, to worship. And so, God, help us to do that in this place through the proclamation of your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in each of these sections that we're going to explore this morning, I think that there are questions that can be used to summarize those sections. And in our first section, which is just verses 12 and 13, the first question is this. Why can't we do this my way? Why can't we do this my way? We have to remember that at this point, the the prophet just learned from God the plan for dealing with the evil that's in Judah. God affirmed Habakkuk's cry for help to deal with the sin around him and then told him that his plan is to raise up the Chaldeans. And it's a plan that Habakkuk doesn't like. And he makes that known beginning in verse 12. Friend, God made you with a desire for justice. And we don't have to look much further than sporting events to see this. See, when you're at a a game cheering for your team, let's say it's the team that your kid is on. And a player from the opposing team commits a foul on your kid. What do you do? Well, it depends on what the official does, doesn't it? If the official blows their whistle and calls the foul, then you applaud. But if the official does not blow the whistle and saw exactly what happened, you make noise. You let them know that the official missed their opportunity to make the right call. So in our text, Habakkuk is reminding God of who he is. He is from everlasting. There was never a time, never a time where God did not exist. He is not just arriving on the scene and now he's going to assess the situation. God has always been. He has always been. There was never a time where God did not exist. And not only has he always existed, but he has always existed as God. He wasn't promoted to the role. He has always been God. And not only is he the everlasting Lord, he is also the Holy One. The word holy implies being set apart. But God is so set apart that all morality is rooted in him. He defines what is moral and what is amoral. Because he is the Holy One who is looked to to understand what is good and what is not good. Because he is the very definition of goodness. He's the Holy One. Okay, God, so since you are holy, since you are the God who judges right and wrong, good and evil, why are you idly watching all of the evil going on around me? That's Habakkuk's question. That's Habakkuk's question. Has that ever been your question? Has that ever been your question? 
Habakkuk's charge against God is that he sees all of this evil that is going on and does absolutely nothing. Nothing. He says nothing. God is missing his opportunity to make the right call. It's almost as if God is giving approval to those committing the evil. But let's be clear, that's not what's happening. He is not giving his approval. But his silence, his inaction is communicating a confusing message to the prophet. Guys, can you relate? Can you relate to that? Do you have a a present or a past prayer that, that you continually lift it to God? That if he would just do this one thing, just this one thing, the issue, the problem that is agonizing me would be removed. And yet, it seems that God has been silent. Or his answer was no. Can you relate? See, for Habakkuk, his disappointment is fueled by God's refusal to execute the prophet's plan. Look at the last part of verse 13. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? We like to play games in my family. And one of our favorite card games is Uno. Now, now, right now, when we play the game, my kids have, my father-in-law created for them these uh, wooden rectangular blocks with slots in them. And what it allows my kids to do is to put their cards in the slots. See, before the, the card holders came along, they had to lay their cards on the table. And then they'd put books around their cards to try and hide them so the rest of us couldn't see. But it didn't work. We were always able to see their hand. And so that's what Habakkuk has done right here. Right here. He has just shown his hand. He is irritated that God is going to use a nation, the Chaldeans, a nation much more wicked than Judah to bring judgment on Judah. Habakkuk thinks it should be the other way around. It should be the other way around. Why, God, why would you use a wicked nation like Babylon to bring judgment on your people? Why wouldn't you use your people to bring judgment on a wicked nation like Babylon? So I think if we were to look at this from the viewpoint of the United States, think of a nation that has, has no concern for human rights, and treats other nations badly. Does that nation come to mind, all right? Okay, so that, now, now if we were to look at this from the, the viewpoint of the United States, imagine God using that nation to bring judgment on us. We would probably say to ourselves, God, look at all of the Christians. Look at all of the churches here in the States. Look at all of us trying to worship you here. Why would you use them to judge us? Why wouldn't you use us to judge them? So again, I think the primary question that summarizes Habakkuk's complaint is, why can't we do this my way? Why can't we do this my way? That's the complaint Habakkuk is making to an always holy, everlasting God. Let's look at the next question. It's found in verses 14 through 17. So his first question is, why can't we do this my way? Second question is, how long is this going to last? How long will this last? Habakkuk plays out what will happen as Babylon conquers Judah. He compares mankind to the fish of the sea and crawling things that have no ruler. And what we need to do is make a point of clarification here. We need to make a point of clarification. Look, Judah has a ruler. 
Judah has a ruler. The ruler of Judah is God. And if Judah were living the righteous life that God had called her to live, listen, Judah's not conquered. Judah's not conquered. The conquering, remember, is a judgment from God on Judah. And if Judah wanted to escape judgment, they need to live the way that their ultimate ruler expected them to live. And we can see just a little bit more of Habakkuk's argument that's creeping in here for Judah to conquer Babylon. That's his argument. We see it in verse 16 when he writes, Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. So the thinking, perhaps, is if Judah conquers the Chaldeans, then perhaps the Chaldeans would have a Nineveh experience and the people would repent of their wicked ways. But that's not what's going to happen. That's not what's going to happen. Although there's still going to be worship, worship is still going to happen, just not worship of God. The Chaldeans are going to worship their ability to plunder helpless people, their ability to bring themselves the finest things that the world had to offer. So Habakkuk wants to know, how long will this last? And I get that question from verse 17. He says this, Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Here's the problem that Habakkuk is up against with both of his questions. His perspective is too limited. His perspective is too limited. Habakkuk wanted the punishment of the wicked so that his own people could be assured prosperity. Do we, do we not do that with our own plans? Do we not do that with our own plans before God? Do we not come with a solution that primarily has ourselves at the center of it? Do we not come with a plan that makes our lives easier? Is it, is it safe to say that our perspective, like Habakkuk's, is limited? See, Habakkuk didn't have God's perspective. God knows the end from the beginning. And God has a very specific goal in mind for the punishment of Habakkuk's people. The goal behind the punishment of Judah was for, was for them to be restored to fellowship with God. So let me ask you something. Because it begs a question that we have to answer as we look at punishment. Your idea of punishment, does it have restoration in mind? Or just payment for the offense committed? When you look at punishment, do you have, is restoration behind the punishment? just payment for the offense. If it didn't include restoration before today's sermon, I hope it does when you leave today. Because that was the goal of the punishment here in Habakkuk. Well, Habakkuk's first question, God, why can't we do this my way? His second is, how long is this going to last? And then his third is this. When will you answer? When will you answer? I need you to know that I'm, I'm not giving the question with the idea Habakkuk is demanding an answer from God. God is not on trial, but it is clear that the prophet does expect an answer and that he's willing to, to wait to receive it. Waiting is the hard part. It's always the hard part. Habakkuk has two options. He can allow his doubts to be either destructive or creative. 
He can use his doubts, his struggles, his agonizing questions, and he can turn from God and he can renounce his faith. Or, or he can keep his hold on God and trust him for an answer. Not even a prophet like Habakkuk can force God to answer what appears to be a burning immediate issue. All that the prophet can do is sit and wait for God's timing. But God did answer. God did answer. He answered Habakkuk's complaint by commanding that the prophet write the vision so that anyone running might read the message. Look at verse 2. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. God rewarded Habakkuk's willingness to wait and to watch to see the message of the Lord. So what does God say? He says, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Impatience is part of the human condition. I am convinced that to be human is to be impatient. And I think, I think the internet perhaps illustrates this the best. Did you know that if you are looking at a website on your phone, that the average time it takes to fully load a mobile website page is 22 seconds to get it fully loaded. 22 seconds. Yet, 53% of visits to websites are abandoned if a mobile site, mobile site takes longer than three seconds to load. We are not patient people. <laughs> we are not patient people. And yet, how often is God's answer to us, wait, wait? Habakkuk, wait. Friend, wait. God has a solution and will reveal it according to his timeline. But he is not indebted. He is not indebted to any humans to reveal the answer prior to the time of his choosing. So God, what do I do if this seems slow? Wait. It will surely come. Whether in prayer or prophecy, contemporary worshipers demand that God act according to the dizzying schedule of those of us who are pressed for time. And God reminded the prophet of the certainty of the message, but did not give him a promise of meeting Habakkuk's schedule. It does not mean that the future events predicted in the vision will come soon. That they will come without delay. That's not the meaning. Only God knows the time for such events and the fulfillment of what God said will come, will not miss God's schedule. It will not delay a moment beyond its appointed time. The answer may delay, but it is sure. The world is not as God intended it, and God is setting it right. God's purpose cannot be thwarted. It is speeding towards its completion. Indeed, that those actions of God that seem to reverse his march toward his goal as the Babylonian conquest of Judah seemed to Habakkuk, to reverse that march, those things may not be reversals at all, but integral parts of God's purpose to save his earth. Okay, God, what do we do? What do we do? If the answer is wait, what do we do? Look at verse 4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. The one whose life is puffed up, puffed up rather, in pride and arrogance will die. On the other hand, the righteous by his faithfulness will live. It didn't matter if they lived in Judah or Babylon those rebelling against God would die. What is your confidence in? What is your confidence in? If you are relying on something of this earth, something like intellectual achievement or wealth 
or military might or beauty or appreciation or pride of birth or status or even the ability to cope and solve problems and master the complexities of modern life wherever confidence is placed in human ability and not in God for the achievement of a satisfying and secure manner of living, their true life cannot be had. The righteous are those courageous enough to accept God's word of promise in a world that is dominated by the horrors of Babylonian power. To look for salvation in a world dominated by persecution requires faithfulness. The righteous are those whose lives correspond to God's leadership. The righteous are not perfect, but they do live according to their relationship with God. So to be righteous means to meet the demands of a relationship. Righteousness toward God is to meet the demands of God toward him and toward others. The righteous person will stand before God in the day of judgment. And Psalm 15 gives an excellent example of the behavior of the righteous. So what do we know? We know from Psalm 15 that the righteous use speech, money, and influence in positive ways. They recognize righteous acts and other righteous persons and treat them properly. And this message to Habakkuk refers to the righteous person living by Faithfulness, this is an important Old Testament term describing loyalty as well as uh, truth and trust. So faithfulness is a way of acting that flows from inner stability. It indicated one's own inner attitude and the conduct it produces. Faithfulness is a type of behavior characterized by genuineness, reliability, and conscientiousness. Habakkuk wasn't to wait with folded hands and bated breath for all of this to happen. He was to live a life of faithfulness. Faith in God was the key to consistent living, even though violence abounded and justice was perverted. That short statement helps believers to persevere even though God disciplines them, and they cannot understand his ways. It provides a solution to the doubt that we sometimes feel in God's all-wise providence and helps us to understand his righteous judgments. So in the final analysis, faith provides the key to understanding the Lord's sovereign purpose and As we'll see next week, it leads us to worship. Habakkuk's revelation emphasized the life-giving nature of God. He cares for his people, even when he appears distant and uninvolved. Though this revelation may take what appears to be an agonizingly long time to appear, Habakkuk, wait for it. God knows and cares for his people. Well, quite honestly, the verses that follow related to the five woes are are a separate sermon, and we need to land this plane. In those verses, we get a glimpse of the sins that the Chaldeans are going to commit, and it's these sins that God is going to use to lead to their eventual judgment and downfall. Briefly, those things, those sins are extortion, unjust gain that advances the nation and the nation's royal dynasties, bloodshed, drunkenness and orgies, and idolatry. And if any of those are in our lives we should repent of them too before they lead to our downfall. So what do we do with today's message? I have several things for us. First, here's what you need to know. You can take your big questions to God. 
you can take your big questions to God. That's what Habakkuk's doing. That's exactly what Habakkuk is doing. He's not taking his big questions and then talking about God. He's taking his big questions to God. So you can take your big questions to God. What's weighing you down? One of the best things you can do is to bring those questions to God and wrestle through them with Him. That's what Habakkuk did. And not only did he bring his questions to God, but once he laid out his questions, he expected an answer and was willing to wait to find out, which is the second application point. Be patient with God's plan. He may not answer you when you think he should or give the answer you think he should, but that shouldn't stop us from taking Habakkuk's posture. Habakkuk waited to hear what God would say, and Habakkuk was willing to be reproved and to have his thinking realigned by God. Friend, is that your posture? I mean, can can God realign your thinking? Can he reprove you? Or do you bring the questions to God and you already know the answers? Take Habakkuk's posture. Be patient with God's plan. Wait for his answer. Why? Well, that's number three. You need to acknowledge. See, you, you just can't see the big picture. God's plan was set in motion before you entered the world. It will continue long after you leave. Frankly, I think if we could see the big picture, I don't think we'd have the capability to handle it. I think we'd be frightened by what we saw, not confident. So I don't think I, I don't I don't think we would have this source of confidence if we could see the big picture. You can't control this plan. But listen, you do play a part in it. You do play a part in it. How do I know? Because you're here. You're here. And as long as you're here, God is using you to advance his kingdom. If you tithe, he's using you. If you serve in a ministry, he's using you. If you share the gospel, he's using you. If you worship him, he's using you. If you encourage others, he's using you. If you disciple your family, he's using you. You can't control God's plan. And you can't see the big picture. But you're playing a part in it. You're playing a part in it. Fourth, remember your primary job in this difficult season is to live by faith. If you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you are not living by faith. Maybe you're like the Chaldeans and you want nothing to do with God. You just want to conquer kingdoms. You want the pleasures and the power that come with this world. Listen, you can have it. You can have it but it comes with a price. And that price is your eventual destruction. Today, Christ is calling you to repent, to turn away from those things, and he extends his forgiveness to you if you would simply repent and place your faith in him for salvation. You can take care of that before going home. Maybe, maybe you're like Judah. You're a religious person, you know the rituals, you know the right things to say, you know what to do outwardly, but inwardly, you've never placed your faith in Christ. The gospel has never arrested your heart. You come here every week, or you come when you feel like it. But going to church never changed your worship, and right now you are overwhelmed by the sins that have separated you from your Savior. Christ's message to you is repent. Repent. He is calling you back to himself. He wants to restore your relationship with him. But you have to first repent. 
Oh, friend, would you care for that today before you go home? Maybe you're like Habakkuk. Can I, can I just remind you of the words of verse 4? But the righteous shall live by faith. Friend, live out that righteousness well. Live it out well. There is a watching world that needs to see you use your speech, use your money, use your influence in positive ways. Be sure to recognize righteous acts and recognize other righteous persons and treat them properly just like Psalm 15 instructs us. Let me close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that your word realigns our thinking. Father, we all would confess today that we come with our plan A. We bring it before you. We let you know how you can solve the situation. We give you ideas. And, and, and Father, then we, we get upset when you say no. We get upset when there is silence. Oh God, I thank you that you are patient with us. I thank you that you don't give up on us. I thank you, Father, that you give us opportunities to repent, that you call us back. You call us back. You forgive. Oh, God, we need your grace. Father, forgive us for the times where we think we know what the answers are and bring them to you. Thank you, Father, for having better plans. Oh, God, I, I pray, though, that this message, God, that we wouldn't hear it and, and be discouraged, God, that instead we would hear it and be encouraged, Lord, that we would fight for what's right, that we would strive to... to and make the places that we live better communities. Father, that we would acknowledge that we don't have control over the hearts of the men and women around us. But we have a, we have a God that we pray to, and he's got a plan in motion, and we're a part of that plan. And so, Lord, help us to play the role that you have given us. Oh, God, may we be faithful stewards of that role. And those roles, husband, father, mother, wife, son, daughter, employee, employer, family, neighbor, so many different roles, ministry leader at church, leader in the community, so many different roles, coach, Help us to be good stewards of those roles. Father, I pray for my friends here who have yet to place their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. I pray, God, that they would pray this prayer. Oh, God, I am a sinner, and my sin is against you. I need a Savior. And so in this moment, I place my faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. I repent of the way I once lived and I make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. Oh, Father, I pray for friends here who also have gone through the motions. They know what to say. They know what to think, know what to do, but it's never happened inwardly. Oh, God, that they would repent, that they would repent some of us have placed our faith in Jesus Christ and, and yet we look more like Judah than we do like Jesus. And so, Father, thank you for extending that hand, for offering 
God, repentance as an option. Oh God, I pray my friends would repent. They would they would forsake what Babylon has to offer. And God, that they would chase after the things of you. And then for my friends who have placed their faith in Christ, oh God, help us to live faithfully. Help us to live righteously. Help us to live in a way that is pleasing and honoring to you during this difficult season. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Thank you for being so good. Amen. Please stand with us as we close. Dismissed this morning. Uh, if you're sticking around, please uh, just stay seated for just a minute or two while the while the others that are leaving right away can can get out without any contact at all. And uh, we have several several members that are in need of our prayers this week. Uh, Letty Churchill, uh, Dennis Hagenberg is in the hospital. Uh, um, Isaac's father, and uh, there's one more. Carol Umlot, yes, sir. Um, please ha- keep them in your prayers, and please also keep uh, keep those who are in your in God's the need of God's spiritual helping as well this week. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to to leave here full of your Spirit and full of your grace, and uh, send that out to the world around us and to those that you've called us to love. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Say hello to the balcony. Hi, Mom.